Chapter 1 Who is Sai Baba? Object of the book The phenomenal spread like wildfire of faith in Sri Sai Baba throughout this great country within the last decade or two and its wonderful hold on the mass mind naturally roused the curiosity of many to put the above question and have necessitated the writing of a full and clear account. Those who know nothing of the personality in whom the faith of many centers ought to know something of him. Those with prejudices or with wrong or defective views about him must be enabled to cast aside such prejudices and views and to acquire better and more accurate ideas about him. Those who have just a faint or superficial notion of Sai Baba must likewise be enabled to get a deeper, wider, and more authentic idea about him, so that they may thereby extend or increase their contact with him. Correct knowledge of any kind is good, but correct knowledge of facts connected with the lives of saints is not only good for the individual who knows them, but is beneficial to society, as in the long run it promotes social unity and ethical, spiritual, and religious study and endeavor. Lives of saints give not merely information for the brain of the listener, but food and strength for his heart and they facilitate the general advancement of the temporal and spiritual interest of mankind. By the study of such lives, basic ignorance and illusions are dispelled. Rajasic and Tamasic qualities such as egotism, pride, hatred, and cruelty are checked or suppressed, and noble virtues like humility, earnestness, and service of saints, Guru Bhakti and Jnana are developed. These in due course lead to the goal of God-realization. Apart from these, even the temporal benefits derived by individuals from appreciation and knowledge of Sri Sai Baba and the acquisition of a real living touch with him are great enough to justify an attempt to place a book like this before the public. Further, there is even now an important section of listeners, however small their number may be, that require something more than mere bread and butter, or health, wealth, and worldly comforts. Those whose spiritual longings should be met in some measure by a work which presents something of the facts about a unique and perhaps one of the strangest of known spiritual personalities adorning the earth during recent times. Difficulty of the task. The task undertaken is, however, extremely difficult. There exists a mass of information about what Sai Baba said and did during his lifetime and about the experiences of him which people who met him in life had. There is an even greater mass of evidence about the experiences of devotees who have after 1918, that is, after his Maha Samadhi, treated him as their true god, or Ishta Divata. The difficulty, however, is to remove the grain from the chaff, to sift and arrange all the mass of evidence that exists, and to present what, after inquiry and investigation, has to be accepted as true beyond reasonable doubt. If the evidence which exists regarding Sai Baba is properly sifted and carefully examined and selected, a trustworthy biography can be written and may form a useful inducement for progress in spiritual matters. The difficulty of sifting the evidence before us is by no means slight. First, Sai Baba himself left his body more than 36 years ago. It is not therefore given to a biographer to go and ask him about the true facts and discover the truth. Very few who met him or benefited from him till 1918 made use of their contact with him to collect and record facts about him. Many of them did not understand him at all. For the mere seeing of Sai did not enable a man to understand him. 
The right approach or mentality that is necessary for understanding a saint was wanting in many who met him. And Sai Baba himself once said, they were coming for water to the supplier of water, but insisted on holding their pots with their mouths down. So unreceptive they were. To many who saw him, Baba's deeds and sayings were rather confusing or perplexing. For instance, when he said, I am not at Shirdi, but everywhere, he who thinks Baba is in Shirdi alone has totally failed to see Baba. You have been with me 18 years. Does Sai mean to you only this height of body? I am God, Allah. Such statements of Baba appeared to them like eccentric pronouncements of a madman. In fact, his queer, unconventional ways, his habit of accommodating himself to all sorts of people, including Hindus, Mohammedans, and others, and his fearless and unorthodox originality failed to impress many of his visitors. Sectarian prejudices and narrow views led many to think and pronounce all sorts of opinions about Sai Baba. Even eminent scholars took him at first to be a madman. Others took him to be a communalist. Few people took him to be a hypnotist, a black magician, while others even denounced him as an immoral and dangerous man who was ruining Hindus and Hinduism. When newcomers like Dr. D. M. Mulkey tried to go to Shirdi, railway personnel en route by their abuse and vilification stopped several. This kind of attitude to Sai Baba is to some extent prevalent even now. Many are the persons who hate Sai, presuming from the name and residence at the mosque that he must have been an iconoclastic Muslim, while others are indifferent to him, as they have not been fortunate enough to get proper information about him. There can therefore be no doubt that there is great need for a book of facts regarding Sai Baba, like the present one. The difficulty of the task must not act as a deterrent. One very closely associated devotee of Baba's, now living, still believes that Baba has only a Mohammedan, a simple man. That's how he still believes about Baba. What can only a Mohammedan mean? It means that even after 25 years of personal experience of him and 36 of his post-mortem glory, the devotee treats him as a communalist, just as he did when Baba was in the flesh. On the other hand, to Sri M.B., a retired high court judge, Sai is now only God, the Param Atman, and this view he held even in 1914, in the last years of Baba's form. Baba wished to convince the devotee, if he was a Hindu, that he was a Mahavishnu, a Lakshmi Narayan, and he made water flow from his feet as Ganga issued from Mahavishnu's feet. The devotee saw it and praised him, but as for the water coming from his feet, that devotee simply sprinkled a few drops on his head and would not drink it coming as it did from a Mohammedan's feet. So great was the prejudice of ages that even one who thought of him as Vishnu thought he was a Muslim Vishnu. Prejudices die hard and the devotee wondered and wonders how people can believe that Baba was a Brahmin and that his parents were Brahmins, when he had lived all his life in a mosque, and when he was believed to be a Muslim. It was only a few persons, like S. B. Dumal, who saw clearly that Baba was neither Hindu nor Muslim, but above all castes, sects, and religions.
It is still fewer people that could rise to the level of accepting Baba's supreme claim that he was Param Atman in all beings. Such persons naturally worship him as Ishta Deva. Thus, there are vast differences, sometimes poles apart, between the various ideas which people have about Sai Baba. These render difficult the task of presenting the real Sai as distinguished from the popular distortions of him. His devotees and strangers alike said that Sai could not be understood and that nobody could know the secrets of Sai Baba. One devotee called him Deva, that is God, but did not always behave as he would towards God. To a Haji who was proud of Hajj, that is, proud of visiting Mecca, Baba said, You do not know what is here. That is, in Sai body or personality. A well-known song is more Babaku Mama Najanori Koi Mo, which means none knows my Baba's secret. Till now, there has been no good biography containing a fair and full and faithful description of his life. In Marathi, the work that can be thought of when facts about Sai Baba are wanted is Himad Pant's Sai Sacharitra. That is a brilliantly written poetical work extending to 53 chapters and over 1,000 pages mostly narrating incidents connected with Sai Baba's life and serving excellently the purpose of Puranic study and daily Parayana. Great as the merits of the book are from the standpoint of a bhakta, it cannot be called a regular biography. It is rather a chronicle of reminiscences or anecdotes relating to him having no arrangement, not even chronological. There is a good adaptation of this Marathi work in an English garb by Sri Gunaji. Other small sketches or introduction to Baba's life have been published in English and other languages, but these also are too tiny to deserve the name of biography. Sketches of a few early incidents in Baba's life were issued as poetic pieces in about 1906, during the lifetime of Baba. And it was written six or seven chapters on whole about Sai Baba, and they were published as books called Bhakta Lila Muthri and uh, Santa Kanta Muthri. These chapters are printed in Marathi. There's a short biographical preface that goes like this. A very short sketch of Sai Baba's life was issued in the Gujarati. This was also before Baba's Mahasamadhi in 1918. A slightly more ambitious work was The Life of Baba in Tamil, written by the present author. This list practically exhausts all attempts made hitherto to publish a biography of Sai Baba. A faithful and full account of Sai Baba's life based on a careful and critical study of the available material regarding his life and the incidents and anecdotes narrated about him by those who contacted, contacted him before and after 1918 is therefore urgently called for and will be, it is hoped, gratefully appreciated by Baba's innumerable devotees. This author has undertaken this work in a spirit of humility and as a true service of Sai Baba, and in the sincere belief that Sai himself has directed him to undertake it. The most admirable of charters of Sai Baba is, Why do you fear when I am here? This in itself is an answer to those who doubt and fear about the possibility of success of a biography of Sai Baba. 